Hello everyone, this is Paul Malutnock, and we are in the study of the book of Revelation. Uh, we will be starting chapter 6 today, and we'll do this in two parts. So this will obviously be part 1 of chapter 6. Now if you remember, uh, the last two chapters were very unique. Uh, they gave us a glimpse of heaven. In chapter 4, a door was open in heaven. John was called to come up there and to see uh, what was going on. And then he would, of course, report that into the book of Revelation uh, for all of us to read. There was uh, a colorful jewels and a rainbow and uh, many colors and activity going on in heaven. And then we heard of the 24 elders that, uh, that were there around the throne. They had crowns on and uh, they were representative, uh, I believe, of the redeemed of Christ. And the 24 were there uh, worshiping. There was a crystal floor separating the expanse of, of heaven and the throne with, uh, with other areas. And then we learned of the four living beings that were seraphim, uh, that they uh, were worshiping and they cried out, holy, holy, holy to him. And then the 24 elders fell down and worshiped and they uh, gave a song. And so then we move into chapter five, which uh, is a continuation of the, the view of heaven and uh, we see that the one on the throne, which is never named, but it is God the Father, had a scroll in his right hand. Now, the scroll was very important for chapter 5. Uh, this is similar type of scroll where uh, it, it, it wasn't, they didn't have books back then. They had scrolls. And then uh, on the outside of the scroll, there was written some summaries and then there were seals on the scroll that uh, kept someone from opening it to the next part. But the scroll there, uh, we believe, was the title deed of the earth and creation. And in this movement where uh, God had it in his right hand and then Christ took the scroll, it transferred the final ownership of all creation to Christ. And uh, within the scroll, we have the judgments of God. And uh, that's what we're going to begin in chapter 6. At the end of chapter 5, there was an oratorio or a song that continued uh, with more and more uh, beings until it builds, until every created thing, and it talked about myriads and myriads. Every created thing would be singing that song. So now we come to chapter 6. And uh, uh, John received this revelation concerning all the judgments that would take place on earth uh, after the Lamb opened the seals on the scroll. God gave him this information to help us understand what will take place in the future. Uh, and I'm going to show you a diagram here that places the seal, the seal, the trumpet, and the bold judgments that begin to unfold here in the context of the earlier revelation concerning Daniel's 70th week. Now, it's important that you uh, go back and look at uh, the 70th week of Daniel and I have it in a previous video. And that would be good to, to go through that and learn that uh, before you continued on in this. But it's not necessary. So, uh, as you see in the chart here, uh, after the rapture, 
but before this uh, seven years begin, which is Daniel's 70th week, there's this time of preparation. We don't know how long that will be. We don't know when the rapture will come. But once this covenant is made between the Antichrist and, and the others, uh, then there is going to be uh, a timeline there of seven years. And so I've given a chart sort of similar like this uh, earlier in one of the earlier videos. But you see their three, first three and a half years on the top line uh, would be called years of protection. Uh, they are part of the tribulation, but they're not the extreme part. Uh, the covenant is broken uh, by Antichrist, uh, this leader that shows up and is going to take care of the world and rule the world. And then the last three and a half years are years of intense persecution. And these are the judgments of God. And this is looking down at the earth. And then after that, you have the second coming of Christ. Now, uh, the last three and a half years, if you follow down the chart, is called the Great Tribulation. Uh, all of the seven years is called the Tribulation. But you see the in the white box, the first six numbers there are the first six seals. And a seal is just something that in that scroll just keeps someone from looking further because it can only be opened by the one who is, is named. And uh, we're going to see Jesus as the one breaking the seals. And he'll go through all six of these seals. And then the seventh seal will break into the seven trumpets, declarations. And then the seventh trumpet, the seventh trumpet will break and open up the seven bowls of judgment. So that's kind of the way this looks like. It's not all chronological. Uh, some believe that these all sort of may happen at the same time. Maybe there's no time uh, regarding this, or maybe it is in chronological order. Nevertheless, we're going to study these and see what happens when these seals are broken. Look into the, the judgment, look into the scroll, and see uh, what uh, Jesus is going to do and what happens on earth. Another chart here is uh, the tribulation judgments. It's just another way of looking at them in a pictorial way. Uh, you see the scroll there on the left and the little dots on there representing the seals. Uh, there are seals today. Uh, people use notary seals and other types of seals. But in uh, the first century, they would have been a, a soft substance like a clay or something. And the person that sealed it would have pushed their, their ring into that and marked it so that uh, only the authorized people could see it. So it was a, a form of protection too, so that no one can see what's inside. Okay, so uh, the order of events predicted in Revelation 6 is similar uh, to the order predicted in the Olivet Discourse or the, the, the uh, uh, Jesus Sermon on the Mount, it's called. That passage is key to understanding the further revelation that God gave John about this future time. These events are the appearance of the Antichrists, war, famine, death, martyrdom, and earthly and heavenly phenomena. And later in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus mentions an event that occurs in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, name, namely the abomination of desolation. Consequently, the events that he described before the midpoint, namely those of the first six seals that we're going to uncover, will probably occur in the first half of the tribulation. Jesus referred to this three and a half year period as the beginning of birth pains. Now here's a little chart uh, that um, shows uh, the gospel references of the Olivet Discourse and how it refers to the specific areas of Revelation. So uh, it would be helpful if you would like to read Matthew, specifically Matthew chapter 24, read through that because much of this is not new. Jesus already mentioned this 
uh, prior to this. Let's get started in verse 1 of chapter 6 of Revelation. He said, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Now John was an eyewitness of this revelation that came to him as sort of a bunch of action scenes in a film, rather than just words on pages of a book. When the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll that was handed to him by God, one of the four living beings invited him to come. This was probably an invitation to the first horseman. The angel gives this command four times, and each time the horseman uh, on a horse comes forth. Joss, John saw a horse which was typically a war machine in the day. Uh, and you can reference that in Job 39, Psalm 76, or Proverbs 21. The horse was white, symbolizing victory, righteousness, and holiness. It gave an appearance of purity, and, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean the rider was righteous. The rider carried a bow, symbolizing warfare, but no arrows. Now, there was a, let me give you a quote here by D.T. Niles in his book, As Seeing the Invisible. He said, when men wage war, they always pretend to be fighting for righteousness. Again, the rider carried a bow, symbolizing warfare, but no arrows in his quiver. And the absence of arrows probably indicates that it was a victory, but without blood. Uh, perhaps he persuaded uh, intensely and won, or perhaps uh, it was just um, uh, people were scared to fight him, so they gave in. The writer threatens war, but it doesn't occur, probably because he accomplishes victory through uh, peaceful means. Some speculate that the rider is Jesus because Jesus uh, rides a white horse in Revelation chapter 19. But the contexts are different. This is the beginning of the tribulation and in Revelation 19 Jesus rides his white horse in at the end uh, as a conqueror. In the Olivet Discourse, the Mount of Olives, uh, that Jesus said, as I mentioned, chapter 24 of Matthew, Jesus predicted that a number of individuals will mislead many people. This has led some interpreters to conclude that a personification of ungodly activity is what the writer represents in this verse. But the most probable view is that this is a prophecy of Antichrist, who will make a covenant with Israel, but only as a pretense for destroying the Jews. So, an interpretation of the white horse and rider, if you think about it, uh, bloodless victory, there were no arrows, a false peace and security, uh, a crown, not a diadem, which is a crown of a true king, but a Stephanos crown which is a crown to someone who accomplishes something or wins a victory that they were given a crown. Uh, counterfeit spirituality and false religion. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.3, Paul says, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains as a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Let's look at the next uh, verse 3. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, 
bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. Now the red, ho red horse probably symbolizes bloodshed and war. The rider of this horse removes uh, the false peace from the earth and begins war. If we observe the Olivet Discourse, the parallelism, the time when peace ends is probably before the middle of the tribulation. The sword is a Makari sword. Now that's uh, an assassination sword or an uprising or warfare type sword. It's not the type of sword that, if you remember the description of Jesus with a sword coming out of his mouth, or uh, a sword in peacetime that people would just carry. The war on earth will follow the manifestation of Antichrist. The warfare in view here seems to be part of what Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 38, said, and in Ezekiel 39, as the battle of uh, Gog and Magog, and Jesus' reference to wars and rumors of wars in Matthew 24. So again, red signifies blood. Blood and fire alludes to war. Uh, peace is removed. Uh, absence of peace ensures conflict and bloodshed. And the great sword is a weapon of war. Continue on in verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the living third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. So a black horse followed symbolizing the ravage of war, namely famine that comes after war. Antichrist, the cause of this famine, seemed to be the rider here. He carries a pair of balanced scales, sort of a symbol of commerce, indicating his control of commodity prices. This means economic inflation and starvation. It's interesting that in this day, uh, in this year, that we are starting to experience inflation. In this case here, and we don't know where it's going to go in our world today, but in this case here, it means uh, significant inflation and it'll get to such an extent where uh, everything will sort of shut down and no one can find commodities and only the rich will be able to eat normally and many in the world will starve. The voice in the middle of the four living creatures, well, that's probably God um, or the Lamb, but probably the Father since he is the source of all judgments. The price of wheat or good food and barley, well, that's cheap cattle food, will be very high. A quart of wheat will provide one meal based on a denarius, which is a day's wages. So if you are working for a family of five, uh, they're going to have to split that five ways, and it's not going to be enough uh, to eat. It could cost a whole day's wages for a quart of wheat. In John's day, a denarius, again, would purchase 8 to 16 times as much food as what it said it will purchase in the future. The poor will have little money left, uh, left over for oil or fuel or health needs or for wine to drink. Um, do not harm may mean do not tamper with, reflecting the strict control over prices that ungodly rulers under Antichrist leadership will have at the time. The causes of this fam famine were not extremely severe since they killed the wheat and barley, but perhaps not the vines 
where the vineyards and the olive trees were also a great commodity uh, in that part of the country. Um, and their roots of olive trees and vines go much deeper. And so the tribulation gets worse. Uh, the rich as well as the poor will suffer. But at this early stage, the poor will suffer much more than the rich. Probably the wars that the ungodly rulers under Antichrist leadership uh, begin will reduce the food supply greatly. These rulers will control it strictly with consequential suffering for many people. One commentator wrote, the price is listed here about 8 to 16 times the average price in the Roman Empire at the time. And for most, there will be no money left over for the necessities like wine and oil. So that's one interpretation of it. Uh, the other interpretation of it is that perhaps the famine will not go that long because it may not, it will affect the wheat, but it won't affect the olive trees and the vineyards. Uh, in either case, uh, the, the higher famine awaits those who refuse to take the mark of the beast and will not be permitted to buy and sell. Again, a denarius used, used, uh, used to be a day's wages in the first century, but prices could go so far and escalate that a person would have to spend an entire day wages just to buy a quart of wheat or three quarts of barley. If you're a poor person and you need to feed your family, you might buy barley with it and it will go further, but it's not really good food and it is used for cattle. Well, that's the end of uh, part one of chapter six. And uh, thank you for staying with me and please tune in to uh, the next part of chapter six and we'll go through uh, the rest up to uh, the sixth seal and we'll have some more things to say that might be helpful to you. Thank you very much and God bless you.